Ahoy hoy, and welcome back to Titanic Talkline. I am Alexia, and, uh, do I have any new housekeeping? Oh, uh, as always, buy t-shirts, find my link tree, like the show on all the places, and, uh, get in touch with me. Tell me why you like Titanic, and, you know, all that good stuff, because, you know, it's all about connecting. And speaking of connecting, I'm really excited to connect you with my episode guest for today, so please go ahead and take a listen. I mean... If, if anyone needs to be edited, it's probably me. Um, <laughs> but uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. But uh, just again, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Could you please just introduce yourself a little bit? No, it's absolutely no problem at all. I'm quite happy to to have the conversation. It'd be good. Great. Um, would you be able to just introduce yourself a little bit and maybe tell a bit of your Titanic story before I like jump right into it? Yeah, that's that's absolutely fine. I'm so sorry. I hit a button and I don't know what happened. I think I accidentally muted you. Uh, I've unmuted myself now, I think. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm... That's okay. I saw something yeah, go and I thought I'd, I'd be full in full flow and then you'd be missing it. <laughs> Oh god, yeah, I'm very, I'm super tuned in. I'm sorry. Please, please continue. What time of the day is it for you? Your end? Oh, it's one thirty. They're in the in the afternoon. There is no excuse for me to be like this. <laughs> That's so fine. That's fine. No, yes. um, I'll, I'll begin if you like. Yeah, no, my name, my name is Simon Medhurst. Uh, live in the United Kingdom in Chelmsford in Essex. Um, yeah, it's lovely to speak to you today. Uh, my great grandfather was Robert Hitchens, who was uh, helmsman and quartermaster on Titanic. Um, obviously, I didn't know my connection with Titanic at all uh, until I found my birth father in uh, 2012. Right. Um, so before that, um, I collected Titanic mem memorabilia and you know books and signatures of survivors and those sort of things from my early twenties. So I was very much into social history when I was sort of in my early 20s. So collecting Titanic material and things like that were, were, were sort of part of that journey. Uh, but say so it wasn't till I was 45 that um, I realised that actually I was a direct relative of Robert Hitchens, his actual great-grandson, um, when I found my birth father, which was quite a, quite a journey from then on, really. It sounds like it. What? I don't want to get like too much into things if you don't want to talk about them. That's but fine. As someone who was a Titanic enthusiast beforehand, what was that journey to finding your father like and then discovering that link? Because I imagine they may have started sort of separately and then become conjoined with that yes. discovery. No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to admit, I wouldn't have known who Robert Hitchens was. Um, I knew who, obviously, Captain Smith and Lightoller and Murdoch and, and all the well-known names, the officers and, and that sort of thing. But sure. um, I I was more collected. I was I'm quite interested in the um, the story of the of the Titanic. So those involved on board and and those sort of things. So those things fascinated me. And I say I, I collected Melvina Dean's signature and a few others, Eva Hart and I found that quite fascinating. Um, and then, yeah, so then um, I think it was it was at that point that I managed to find who my birth father was. And then, it, again, it's, it was complete shock because it was, I think it was my sort of brother and sister-in-law that come up to me and sort of phoned me up and said, we think we know who your birth father is, you know, that, that he's actually connected to someone on Titanic. Wow. And it was a bit of a, um, well, if you can sort of imagine that sort of, after collecting and, and being involved in Titanic, and then all of a sudden you're you're a direct relative, and there was a, a picture that I I had grown up with really, which was a picture of um, my nan, which my mum always used to say, "Oh, that's your real nan," mm -hmm. and uh, so I had this picture that I grew up with, which was of her holding me as a baby, oh. and um, yeah, it wasn't until I found found my birth father I said, "Oh yeah, I took that picture. That's that's Robert's daughter." Wow. So all of a sudden, it was a, it was sort of that mind blown moment of of realization that you know that there was as a baby being held by Robert's daughter, and that I was actually you know his great grandson, and it was like 
almost unbelievable really it was it was a real journey there's a lot more to the story really than that but but that was really the basis of it but then then it gave me that thought actually I would like to know more about Robert mm -hmm. so that was really my journey from from 2012 which was exactly 100 years um, Great. that I then started that journey really which was to find more about Robert and to to have more of a connection with the Titanic story and, and then to maybe promote it more. Mm -hmm. um, which is funny because when I was, when I first sort of found out, I, I thought there was, there was hardly anybody on the internet that was really sort of, I don't know, doing anything Titanic-y. That's what I thought. So that's sure. why I set up the Titanic memorabilia Facebook group. And then, and that's, that went really well. And then it just sort of exploded really. And then, um, and then I realised there were other groups, a few other groups on there about Titanic as well. Um, so yeah, up to that point, I hadn't really even thought there was such a an interest in Titanic. Uh, mm -hmm. I do now, right? Uh, but, <laughs> but, but I didn't then. Yeah, it's a it's a very robust community, not not just online, mm. but when you think about the sheer volume of things that people are still creating yes it's incredible but um when you started looking into his life i i know a little bit about his life because i talked to um sally ann nilson yes. a couple weeks ago yes right um she's wonderful yes. that was an absolutely fascinating conversation but one of the things that was sort of highlighted in that conversation to me was the perception of blame that followed him. Yes. And I imagine that's something that, I mean, he, he, ne he did never recover from that. No, I mean, did. I mean, he, he, he really did suffer all his life. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, having sort of having to struggle with, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, really, and, and having all of those issues after Titanic um, did, did sort of take that journey with him, really. Uh, the one thing I think I found most of all, which was most fascinating, was that he, his journey on ships never stopped. You know, once, once he left Titanic, he continued as a quartermaster, um, so, you know, he traveled, traveled on numerous ships after, mm -hmm. after Titanic, never as big as Titanic, but right. he, he continued on, um, with, with loads of shot. And I've sort of been searching his journey really. And it's phenomenal. I thought that, you know, when you went on a ship, you might be on there sort of all, all your life sort of thing, but no, mm -hmm. they would be on for six months or, or whatever. And then they would go on to another one. So yeah so it, i um you know i also assumed maybe because i'm just not smart enough to think about it but i assumed it was more like captaincy where it was sort of semi-permanent once you were yes. the insert rank here on yes. a ship you were that that's what i pictured i was like yes. once you are the quartermaster <laughs> of titanic yes. that is it and if you leave this ship you will die Yes. Now, I have to admit, I did think the same, and it wasn't until I actually started going through the records of the ships that Robert was on mm -hmm. um, that I realised, actually, he was constantly on ships after that. Um, you know, a whole list of, of ships that he travelled on for a semi, sort of semi, you know, for, I don't know, as I say, a few months, and then would go on to the next ship. He'd go to one port, then get another ship and come, you know, he'd be a second mate, he'd be a quartermaster. Mm -hmm. Um Able seaman, you know, he, he went through all these ships, but but he, you know, I think maybe we think that after Titanic he would have been a Jonah and that would have been pretty much it. Nobody would want him after that. Mm. But actually, there, there was never that stigma afterwards. You know, he right. continued on as normal um, because there was there was no blame to him. You know, it's because he was at the helm mm -hmm. didn't make him responsible for the fact that Titanic hit that iceberg. Exactly. I'd, I think you know, it's unfair to put the blame on any one person. Yeah, I mean, Sally Nielsen is is excellent on the life of Robert Hitchens. Mm -hmm. She's she's had a lifelong knowledge of, of Robert. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would recommend her book for, for definitely for 
understanding okay. his life and and that journey he had. Um, so yeah, Sally, Sally's excellent when it comes to the life of Robert Hitchens. It's been a great help to me, to be honest, to understand Robert more myself, because yeah. obviously for me, it's, it's been a brand new journey. Uh -huh. um, and really for me, same as Sally really, is to um, show that Robert did exactly what he was asked to do. Yeah. You know, he, uh he had a job to do and he did it to the letter, you know. I think that maybe, you know, there's there's a lot of tendency for people, and, and I do this too, to sort of speculate about things. Yes. But when you break it down to what happened, it was a ship, a literal ship in the night with two young men high up in the air, in the cold, mm. squinting to see in the darkness. Yes. And as soon as they do, they do what they're supposed to do. And so that's not their fault. They didn't put the iceberg there. No, uh, exactly. Murdoch didn't pause for 10 minutes to check the time and read a magazine. He reacted immediately, gave yes. an order to Hitchens, who also did not stop to tie his shoes. He immediately started going. Everyone did what was within their capacity. Mm. And I believe that when you look back, sometimes it's easy to say you should have, should have, should have. And that's mm. where that blame starts to come from. I think with also with um, where Robert was, um, you know, there wasn't there wasn't a view outside. It's not like a car right. or, or a plane. You know, the, the blinds are drawn. His his focus is totally on the compass mm -hmm. that that's all he's got to do. That's his that's his main job is to keep an eye on the compass and to follow that those orders. There was nothing else for him to do. Right. Um, and so it wasn't as if he was sort of, oh, we could look out the window and think, oh, there's an iceberg. It, it just wasn't that case. You know, he literally, as soon as he was given the order, the order was done hard as starboard. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that's it really, isn't it? It's, it's uh, easy to try and, I suppose someone always likes to think of a, a scapegoat or someone to blame. Right. But... You know, that night, there were, as you say, there was a, a culmination of different things that came together to cause exactly. the disaster. You know, was it going too fast? Maybe. You know, could it have gone a little lower rather than where it was? It did go a little lower anyway, I think, but just the mm -hmm. fact it could have gone a bit lower. But there, there's right. a lot of things there. You know, the fact that it, it was delayed in its, its sort of setting off, there's, there's a whole list of things there. Yeah, it. At the end of the day, it's just sad what what happened. And but one thing that I I didn't understand was that he couldn't see outside mm. because you know I I remember for example watching the the Cameron film. Yes. And the way that they cut back and forth. I mean, it's a movie, so of course yes. there's a lot of sets and camera angles. Yes. And they can't show everything all at once. But in the way there would often be cutbacks between the bow and um, right outside of the yes. bridge, it, as a small child, gave me the impression that Hitchens could see outside. Yes. And yeah. it's because there's. it's also never explicitly stated. I mean, why would you have to state it? But it's one of those things where they don't really make it clear. It's like they no. you can't. See. I mean, you've got to remember he was in the wheelhouse, and there was mm -hmm. a navigation and bridge in front of him. Yep. So you know, it's not it's not just like a, a sheet of glass, and there it is. So right. yeah, and I think um, I think if you a very a very good thing to read probably for anybody who's interested in Titanic is to actually read the inquiry, especially mm -hmm. probably the British uh, inquiry, uh, which gives you know, the whole the whole story of Robert Hitchens in there because he's part of he's one of those who were interviewed by the Attorney General anyway. Right. So you can always um see that online and see the British and American inquiry which which is for me is quite a special thing because Robert's interviewed mm -hmm. it's almost as if you can hear his voice. Right. So which does give you a little bit you know, he's able to actually say what happened and also to, um, I suppose, bat off anything that was said against him as well. You know, any mm -hmm. accusations that might have been 
sort of thrown towards him, he was, was able to say, look, actually, this is what happened. What was it like for you after you discovered your relationship and then connected with Sally? Because not in the same boat necessarily, but you're of the same sort of generation yes. away, yes. but having different relationship. What was it like to connect with her? Uh, it was, I mean, it, probably I had her book before I met her. Um, so I was able to sort of read the book and learn a bit about Robert himself. Mm -hmm. she, she's done an awful lot of um, detective work. You know, she's, yeah. she's been and seen the family and got information, which is brilliant because that, that, that saved me a lot of problems. <laughs> because it, it say, you know, it was like giving a, a, a you know, a ready-made family history for me. Um, so, yes, I mean, Sally's lovely. Uh, I've met her now a few times, so um, we don't probably get as much of contact as we'd like, probably, but as cousins, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's a good thing because it, it just means that I have the information that probably I'd have had to search for years to find, um, but but already already there for me, which which was really really good, and I'm very very thankful to her really for for all the work she's done. Um, I think partly to show that Robert was a real person and mm -hmm. that he wasn't guilty of anything. Yeah, you know. So um, yes, he wasn't. I think the one thing is probably important is to realise he's not. He wasn't perfect. Sure. He you know he was a he was a sailor. And I've no doubt he had some choice words to say now and again. Yeah. Um, but he did do exactly what he was asked to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the important thing, even with the lifeboat. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a mile away. You know, you've got to remember that he, he left the life, he left the ship at one o'clock. Mm -hmm. So he was well out before the ship went down. So it wasn't as if he was just around, literally just around the corner. He, he, was, he was a good distance away. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there was, you know, I think, I think he would say it would be impossible. I think he said it was, it was too far away. Yeah. Uh, and after the lights went out, he wouldn't have known which direction to steer anyway. Uh, and I think if we were all in that situation where we had to make a decision, you know, I remember speaking to uh, David Hazeman, mm -hmm. who was Edith Hazeman's son. And he'd uh -huh. spent a lot of his life as a quartermaster himself, which was which was quite fascinating, really, um, because he said there was a few things that you had to be aware of, that if the ship was sinking, or you know what were certain things that you needed to do to make sure you were well away from the ship. Sure. Uh, and he really said gave three things, and that was one: the suction of the ship going down. Right. Uh, secondly, items being thrown overboard. So oh. you had things like deck chairs and anything that wasn't fixed down would have been thrown over. So you had to yeah. make sure your lifeboat was well away so you didn't get showered with those sort of things. That didn't even occur to me. Yeah, and then the third thing he said was being swamped and then oh. you have no life saved at all. Yeah. You know, So if, you, if you're if you a little lifeboat with 100 people trying to get on board, then no one's saved. Yeah. So, you know, there's lots of things that may be run through your your mind you know when you've like about six would say was well over an hour in the water in mm -hmm. the dark you've got to remember it was also heading towards the light that it was it was sort of told to go towards mm -hmm. you know that it was told there's a light go to the light once you've reached whatever that wherever that whatever that light is whatever ship that is offload mm -hmm. the passengers and come back and get more right so that was really the aim of a few of them, it wasn't just Robert, there was a few lifeboats that were told exactly the same thing, to go go to that light. So, you know, if we were in charge of a lifeboat, would we have made the right decision? I don't know. I don't either. And I think uh, everyone likes to think they'd be Cameron's low, who, you know, he's like, right, got to go back, moving it around, get it together. We have lives to save. Yeah. I love to think, because I'm also one of those kinds of people that gets involved in things. Mm. So I like to think I might be that person who's like, no, I'm going to go back and I'm mm. going to rescue people and it's yeah. going to work. 
and then we'd all die. Yeah. That seems like something that would happen to me. Not because I'm, I think I'm superwoman and can do everything, but just yeah. because I think I'd be panicking more, less smug and more, we have to help. We have to help somebody yeah. do something. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I was speaking to um, um, Edith, uh, uh, Margaret Brown's great granddaughter, um, Helen mm-hmm. Besinger, and she she was of that same mind probably that she would have gone back mm-hmm. um but she also said was robert wrong and i think she would say no he wasn't wrong he did what he felt was the right thing to do at the time would she have done something differently maybe and i think that's that's the that's the sort of and i feel you know she was very good in that and i felt she was honest Mm-hmm. You know, and I think yes, we we may we may have done things differently, or we may not. But as I say, Robert made that decision that he wanted to go towards the light, mm-hmm. save those people, and he was again when he when he reached uh, Carpathia at probably about eight o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. he was the last one to leave the lifeboat, so yeah. he made sure that everybody was off before he got off. It wasn't a, a scramble to get off. You know, he, he did his duty, whether he did it perfectly, maybe, maybe not. Um, but on the whole, I think he did exactly what he was commanded to do. It's really hard to try to even think of being in that situation. Yes. Because if you go back, you run all of the risks you mentioned. Yes. Being swamped caught by the suction or it's dark what if you just get too disoriented Mm. and get lost or something there's so many risks but then when you have the time to consider the other side you're just like but how could you let that many people just die yeah it's it's complicated i think that i mean if you think about it you you've got a boat that could probably hold about 60 Yep. You've got roughly, I mean, I think they had about 28 or something on board, which is important to realise that Robert wasn't in charge of loading the lifeboat. No. That was down to Lytola and Murdoch. And yep. you've got to remember that Lytola had a different, he, he took things slightly different to Murdoch. Another uh, very important thing to note. Yeah, and I think that to me is very important because Lytola was definitely women and children only. Emphasis um, on the only. Yeah, and uh, Murdoch was women and children, and then men could get on board. So, mm-hmm. you know, with with the lifeboat six, that was not Robert's decision to fill. Right. All he was in, all he was to do was to be in charge of the lifeboat. Right. Not the filling of it. So very often it will be, oh, Robert only had twenty eight people. Why did he only let that amount of people on? Wasn't his decision. Um. So I think that's that's quite in, in my mind that's quite important um, because yeah. he was in charge of the lifeboat, but he wasn't in charge of the loading of the lifeboat. That was down to Lightoller at that at that point. Right, he was part of the larger formation. Yes, it, I think. Yeah. I mean, one other thing probably that's probably on, on a lot of people's minds is the is the scene on 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 the film Titanic with. Mm-hmm. Robert sat shouting and doing all sorts of things, um, which, you know, you have the, the comment that would say, look, you know, shut that hole in your face sort of idea. Um, For anyone who doesn't remember in the film, Molly Brown is arguing their lifeboat yes. to go back. And the, the, the sailor who is not outrightly named is Robert Hitchens. And he tells her, we can't go back. We'll get swamped. And mm-hmm. there will be room for one more on this boat if you don't shut that hole in your face. Yeah, and that, that was said on Lifeboat 8. Yep. Um, so that was Abel Seaman Jones. Um, he was in charge of that boat. So I can understand why Robert Cam- uh, James Cameron did probably decide that he would culminate all the lifeboats into one. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is he would have been better off being more generic Yeah. rather than maybe using Robert as that all-compassing uh, problem, if you like. It's um, the same way that 
myself and a few people criticize his um treatment of murdoch and the yes, fictional absolutely. world where it's like I, that is an intriguing plot line but firstly it goes against everything i've ever learned about his character to accept a bribe yes um and secondly i mean not even this, the the bribe was the worst part to me whereas that i was just like come on man really yeah. you gotta you gotta take him down with the ship yeah, I mean, I I think, um, I think I was, I mean, I've, I have to admit, I've watched the film once. And that might shock you, really. Um, I've watched that film once because I felt that the the film itself is is phenomenal. The, the actual mm-hmm. way it's been filmed. Sure. Um, I think the Jack and Rose thing. I know it's a it's a lot of people, a lot of people like that, and what have you. It, I think it probably misrepresents. A bit of the story because they right. didn't exist which is a little bit uh, i know i've spent time doing i do quite i don't i do quite a few school talks mm-hmm. um and very often the question comes to me did they ever find the necklace <laughs> um so in that sense <laughs> it, it has a little bit of that sort of side to it but on the whole i think the film Titanic has opened a whole new generation to it, to the story of yeah. Titanic. So in that sense, I'm not going to um, be too harsh on the film. Um, my favourite film, I think, is A Night to Remember, which is the film that I I right. much prefer and enjoy watching. I um, have to admit, I haven't seen it oh, yet. Oh, no. <laughs> I know. Oh, you should I be ashamed to... of yourself. I am. <laughs> and I, I am because I haven't brought it up on any episode so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I think, um, I think I was... anybody anybody who yeah. who's, um, loves Titanic needs to watch A Night to Remember. It's, um, mm-hmm. Again, it's not a perfect film, but I think because there were survivors that were involved in the production, you know, they, they were there to help. Uh, yeah. with the making of the film there's a bit probably a little bit more a little bit more in that one I think for myself but as I say um, when it comes to the actual film itself you know you can't you can't parallel the Titanic film for its grandeur really and, and what it's right. able to show with the rooms and and everything about it is just you know it's mind-blowing to, to watch but, um, so I was part of that generation that yes. got introduced via the Cameron film. And I will say that it is a beautiful movie. Mm. And being young when I saw it, having it be so vibrant and colorful yes. and modern yes. Yes. helped me tie it together. because. I, I, I was eight when it came out, and to me, there was the present and everything else. So yes. ancient Egypt may as well have been happening at the same time as Titanic for all my ability to perceive time could pick up. Yeah. So it illustrated a past event in a present way that I could understand, and then it was like, oh my gosh, that was hard. Yeah, I think I think the film has definitely made a huge difference when it comes to Titanic enthusiasts uh, mm-hmm. and the interest that there is in Titanic, which is, I have to admit, I'm completely mind blown by the <laughs> by the actual, um, well, just the people who are really fascinated by the story of Titanic. Right. Uh, I mean, there are there are different aspects to it because there are some people who are really fascinated by the the build of Titanic, mm-hmm. the structure. Mm-hmm. There's people who are interested in the internal furnishings of, of Titanic. Then there's then there's probably a bit more like myself who who's interested in the people of Titanic, and their stories and and those sort of things that that really touch the heart probably more mm-hmm. than anything else. It's so funny that, you mentioned that's me, that. Really. Well, that's actually the same reason that I'm interested in Titanic yes. is because to me it is a human story. Yes. It's you know I. I think that the recovered plates and saucers and spoons and forks are fascinating and interesting, Mm. but the most heartbreaking thing to me is that at the bottom of the ocean are people's whole lives. There were wedding gowns down there. Mm. There were 
life savings, things for children, people going to funerals. There were people whose lives and legacies disappeared. And I'm curious about those people because they were real people. And now that Titanic has become sort of part of the mythos of life on Mm. Earth, it sometimes gets a little hard to separate the the Titanic from the ship Titanic. Yes, I think um, I think that's where I've been, I suppose, working my hardest, I suppose, with, with Instagram and Facebook and what have you, to mm-hmm. promote not only Robert, but the, the true lives of these people, that it's, it, it's not just a story. There's, there's more, more behind the story of Titanic. So that it, so that people maybe sort of when they're looking at the story of Titanic get touched by it, mm-hmm. rather than just a head knowledge of the of the story and and that, but actually think you know there was there were these people they were on board you know only only seven hundred and twelve survived, right? Out of all those people, only seven hundred and twelve survived, and and for me to be a relative of of one of those that actually survived. Is in my mind is phenomenal because um, I have to realise that there's families, great grandchildren, whose great grandparents didn't survive, so they haven't got that history. You know, it's a it's it's a dark history in some ways. Mm -hmm. So for me, I feel it's right that they all get spoken of. They all get that opportunity to tell their story about their their relative. So they don't don't doesn't disappear into the into the into the distance. You know those things can be brought to life. Yeah, it reminded me of when I was first setting up, <clears throat> excuse me, this these interviews. Um, I was suggested to reach out to Angelica Harris. Yes. Yeah, and I didn't know who she was at the time, but I was like, hey, I'll talk to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I will, and I reached out to her. And she mentioned, you know, she was related to the Paracchio brothers. And I made a personal effort to not look them up, which yes. did make me go into that interview knowing nothing. But it was, in my mind, I wanted to learn about her uncles mm. from her. Yes. Yes, I agree. And, and and for me, it was the same with Sally Nielsen's book. Mm-hmm. You know, reading the book was, was for me that massive eye opener mm-hmm. uh, and like you listen to Angelica's story there, it, it brings things to life, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and each person has their own story. You know, each person has that personal knowledge of this person, you know, their day to day life, you know, Robert's, Robert's love for his wife, mm-hmm. you know, he had, you know, he had a, a deep, deep love for his wife. Um, and you know, when she died uh, in 1940, mm-hmm. he died the same year. She died in the in the March, and he died in the September of the same year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it's you know, it's it, it's that connection to realise that these people, you know, I believe he, you know, there died of a, almost of a broken heart because he loved yeah. her so much, yeah. and then to lose her in the March, and then for him to die in the September of the same year. Um, off the coast of Aberdeen on a, on a on an English trader on the English trader mm-hmm. so you know there's there's lots of true life stories there isn't there those little stories that maybe are only brought out by maybe family members relatives that could just give that little bit of um, I suppose a bit of story. life to the person yes because I think one of the last things Angelica told me was about um, a photograph taken of the brothers Yes. Um, and one is wearing a bow tie, I believe, and the other has a silk rose. Yes. And she said that their mother made those for them and said, if you get your picture taken or when you feel, you know, happy, put one of them on, you know, remember your mother. And yes. they got their photo taken wearing those two little little things from home. Yes. Yeah. And that's a really, like, personal little story. Yes. Uh, I mean, for, for me, Robert, 
didn't have any belongings, as far as I know, that were ever kept, because he, he really mm -hmm. was buried in a pauper's grave in, a grave in Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. um, anybody wants to go there, there is actually a gravestone now, which I managed to get uh, oh, put in, um, which was in 2019, I managed to get a, a gravestone put there for Robert. But it was, it was like a, a communal grave, really, mm -hmm. uh, with another person who, who wasn't connected to Titanic, mm -hmm. um, but they were just buried in the same place. Right. Um, so that was sort of nice to be able to get that done. But with Robert, he the only thing that ever was passed down was a tray. Sounds a bit of a strange thing. Um, mm -hmm. But he had a tray that he used to carry around with him on all his trips when he went, mm -hmm. when he would have disappeared and then he would come home. And then eventually this was, this tray was given to my great grandmother, mm -hmm. um, to my grandmother, sorry, and then that was passed to my father, who then's given it to me. So it's a, a tray with a map of the world on it, um, which is quite special because it's the only thing really that, as a family, that we know of that Robert ever owned or or has, has well, been kept by him till the end. If so you can um, hear me, I can no longer hear you. Sorry. Hello. Hello. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. No, that's fine. Yeah, we they say the tray is the only thing that Robert passed down the family, really, that that, that now I possess, which, as I say, it's got um, a map of the world in it. I don't have a connection to the Titanic. It's just something that so gives that personal connection to him. Sort of um, as far as I know, that's, that's literally, or as, as an item, is the only thing. I, I have a few letters of his interest. Um, that he wrote so I can... um, and things like that. Which is I imagine quite it's very, well, but, very special um, to feel yeah, it's, that uh, it's having that connection, connection with, to with know that people, there really. was a person that carried this tray or pocket watch or whistle with them everywhere, and now it's with you. Yes. Mm. Yes, and uh, for me, mm -hmm. in some senses, I've I've got both sides of the coin because I've I've grew I grew up with not having a connection with Titanic, so I'm in the same boat, if you like, as everybody else to start with. So I know what it's like right. Hard to, get to venom out of the wound. and to enjoy without having a connection. And now having a connection, I can see it from the other side now as well. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I can understand why people have this fascination with Titanic, why they, they have this say, connection. I haven't touched on your book you yet, but you your book is actually 360 Days of Titanic. You know, you can't Did remove I yourself from it. It's, it's there. It's part of you. Wrong. Um, I may have. becomes part of your life. Yeah, there we go. So it's um, I can see that. I mean, the three hundred sixty-six is very large the book on the I've cover, written, so it sticks out. That's to the me. whole. That's the whole purpose of why I wrote it. Really, was to bring these people to life. Full circle. Hmm. Yes, yeah, Titanic day by day, three hundred sixty-six days with the Titanic. Yes. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, it's, I mean, some people say, why are 366 days not 365? Right. Um, but 
but purely, purely because there is there is a normally you know there is a leap year there is that day when somebody was born or died on that on that day so it has to be that um interestingly mm-hmm. 2000 uh, 1912 was a leap year as well um interestingly just just out of a not that it matters too much in that sense but that that mm-hmm. was as well but yeah i mean it, the book uh for me was a labor of love it took about 7 years to get it together um but I wanted to try and encapsulate everybody on Titanic. Mm-hmm. So rather than just the well-known rich and famous, but down to the very mm-hmm. stoker, to the very maid, to to whoever, fireman, to whoever was on Titanic, to be able to say, here's your story. Um, so it was... Mm-hmm. There were some there's some fantastic sites out there that give you so much help. Encyclopedia Titanic was think one. So. I um, have been using a, it as a like a daily calendar. The the American Inquiry um, there. instead of reading it straight um, through. I spent a lot um, of time if you time haven't read Simon's find, book, um, shame on you. Um, you know, suitable um, quotes and facts no, uh, and figures shame and on me because things I still that would be seen a night interesting for people to work their way through in the book. <laughs> but um, um, it's not structured it's, like it's a traditional narrative. It's broken really down day by day out. in a calendar year. Um, and you list everyone who was born yes. on that day. So today, um, August 13th, it would be everyone on Titanic whose birthday was the 13th. It's also everyone whose death day was the 13th <laughs> and also has at least one quote per day from a survivor mm. mm-hmm. right Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I've tried to do, it's not possible, it wasn't possible to do it for every day, but actually do a survivor's quote mm-hmm. for somebody that was in that list of births and deaths. It doesn't always work out that way. I, I tried my hardest, but it's, it wasn't possible to do it to all of them. But I tried as hard as I could to make sure that that, was, that could be done. Uh, but still, if, if I wasn't able to do that, then I still would try and put a quote or things like that in it. But mm-hmm. it... I wanted to bring it, bring these people alive, really, to, to give some, to what it would be like that mm-hmm. night, what different people saw that night, what different people thought that night. Um, and that was really where I went with that one. As you say, the idea was to make it as easy to read as possible so that it was a, for, so for anybody. Right. So that you can, you don't feel like you've got to pick up and read pages and pages. You could just, li- you literally just pick wow. a page and say, right, today's date. I'll just look at today's date, and that's it. Like you say yourself, and that was really the idea of it, so that it could be on the table. And you pick it up. You just look at one day, and and then you can put it down again. It wasn't wasn't designed necessarily that you just literally read your way through it from end beginning to end. I know somebody who's done that. Yeah. <laughs> So it's, very brave of them to do it, but they've I done it. Gone through it. The whole I liked it. Um, it's on my cities, couch, so, um, and in the morning um, when I'm putting yes, my shoes it, it, on to really take my dog out um, really before I do, learn I a little bit about the, the different today. people on board, really, and, and learn a little bit. I know that I, I thought well of me. school teachers. I thought of um, people who aren't necessarily very good at reading, but just enough to to help. I think if I read it just end to end, it would be too much to process at once because it isn't a narrative. Um, there's no filler. It's it's the facts. And I, mm-hmm. I feel if I personally read it just like yeah, that, I, think that's what I would I, that's forget really names. Doing, it wouldn't I matter. I wouldn't remember do. quotes. Um, it, just, it would so be that's, too that's much. Encouragement so to I me. like taking it in this bite-sized um, way to be like, okay, I can deal with eight names today yes mm-hmm. yes mm-hmm. yes 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I have dyslexia, um, yeah. which I've had to deal with all my life, really, which um, when it comes to things like a book is for me would be momentous mm-hmm. because you know when you when you have if, mm-hmm. some, if someone's listening to this and they have dyslexia they know exactly where I am on this um, and so to, to actually be able to get a book together you know it, it was for me quite an achievement to do that um, and so in the very process of doing the book to make it easy easier to read so that somebody who maybe isn't a mm-hmm. big reader can pick up and just read a page so that that's that's where i was going with it as well and i've had some great support um people who who have helped me along the way a Mm -hmm. a man named phil gowan who was a historian he died a few years ago but i was in correspondence with him and he'd done a huge amount of work Mm -hmm. on um on the people on titanic and had a vast knowledge and a vast library of of information so for me, he was he was just that, you know, perfect person that was able to help me with an awful lot of things. Um, but to also have the mm-hmm. support of people like uh, Rory Golden, who was the who's been down to Titanic, uh, and it's recently recently been there um, this year actually. So mm-hmm. yes, exactly. So he's been with them there. So to me, that was quite. It was good to have somebody. I tried to make it so that you had a historian, um, somebody like myself would be more to the crew. I had Helen Bezinger who oh, was able to just really yeah, just say straight. a word for <laughs> the passengers. So uh, Rory Golden, who really was to do with like exploration and, and that side side of it, and then Tim Trower, who was who was going to be mm-hmm. the historian side of it. So, for me, you know, all these people were were a great help and, and a support, which. You know, them doing a forward for the book was was a real treasure for me. Um, yeah, I know most people don't look at the forwards, um, but yeah, for, for me they they were important that I had people like that on board mm-hmm. with me, who were willing to to support me as well. And uh, a lovely lady called Nadi Gabanova, who's who did the illustrations. That's awesome for the centre as well. She she to was just, um, a great support and willing to, to do the pictures for having me. Having photographs um, reproduced is bad or anything. Like she's done an awful lot more but since, actually. I do but think it's she's, always she's, interesting to, I, for me, it was to something have different. illustrations in books. Seeing, I think more her books artwork, should have illustrations For me, it was just something them. different than the norm. So I felt that, that that was where I wanted to go with the pictures mm-hmm. uh, in the centre of the book. Right. So... Wow. Yeah. Yeah, the um the actual wow, thank you. Yes. I think you, you get lots of books that have lots of pictures and they're pictures we all see over and over and over again. So I felt let's let's just go completely different. Rory Golden gave me um the picture that he took, which is on the mm-hmm. on the book itself, uh on the back. Um the wheel. Great, because yeah, so he he did that for me and, and not that has got to go on, that's got to go in. So that, that was you know, that was quite nice because that connects it all up for me. Two great grandchildren of Robert um, Hitchens. We have say, so there is that a picture, very good exploration uh, of his life and the, a literal year-long look at the um, lives and the and souls that were on that, that, that one, ship. So. I think that's incredible. And what do I have behind me? Oops. I have a time travel Titanic fiction book behind me. I also have Violet Jessup's book. You know, there's, just, there's so much to learn. And I, yeah, and it's not to say that things that are thoroughly academic are unimportant, but for me personally, it yes. is the human interest that gets and keeps me. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. 
Yes, there is. Yeah, I mean, for me, yeah. a lot of people have been on this journey a lot longer than I have. Uh, and I think that's the, you know, for me, to begin to learn about Titanic from properly, really, from 2012, <laughs> you know, I really am at the beginning of my journey. I never realised, really, how much information, how many stories there are, how much, just just the, the mind-bogglingness of it, <laughs> if that makes sense, um you know i and, just uh, got it, off a call you know, with mark <laughs> you know people come up to me and say oh you, you're a bit of a historian i think not not nowhere near you know i yeah. literally i i am i feel like a baby when it comes to the titanic information um it's so, so it's nice it's, telling um, you about how hot it's been over there you know, when, you I, when i meet so people who, who know their information people like mark chernside and steve oh. hall and other people who just uh Oh, man. he is a mm -hmm. he is a, he is a walking encyclopedia. He, he, he is, you know, okay. he's unbelievable. I've met him a few times. And he's such a lovely, such a lovely fellow. Um, oh, it's, it's it is really hot. <laughs> I've got a fan blowing at me now at the moment. It's that hot for I, us? But, I'm um, glad for that. Though, but yes, no, I think this um, is the exact kind the of knowledge, knowledge I, mean, I want to seek I, I do the Instagram, which. It's um, important which that for me was an opportunity those stories to just be told, put not things just out there, just little bits and pieces, little snippets about for people to enjoy. The time, but um, I want to know so about people the crew that as well. and so it's the other sort of passengers, people who's working at those things. Those stories have to, very much been silenced. To help people you know, learn part a bit of more. I was super eager to get Dan Parks on because he's one of the top authorities on William Murdoch, who is sorry, Robert. Murdoch is my favorite Titanic officer, but um, it was because I wanted to know more about him. It's not that his career yes. isn't important, but it's like, yes. well, I want to know what they were like. Were they the kind of people that like to wear socks indoors or what? Did they like tea or coffee? Who are they? What did they want? Yes. 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 Oh, good. Yes. So, I've actually been talking yes. to Angelica. Yeah, exactly. And we're trying um, to put some kind of event together next year to raise money. Also working for the with lighthouse. the. The Titanic Memorial Actually, the Lighthouse planning call in a few weeks. <laughs> project. That, that for me also is something that I'm quite involved in. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'd like to see that restored. I'd like to see that back to what it was in New right. York and, and have that as a... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I've been, mm -hmm. I've sort of been involved in that from the very beginning. Um, mm -hmm. But being more involved now, probably than ever before, I've sort of decided to take up the mantle mm -hmm. and get involved in that more, more, more mm -hmm. personally, more involved in it to get that, you know, because, you know, Margaret Brown was the, the one that set that up and, she was on yeah. lifeboat six. Our hope is to find. Uh, um, my great grandfather was on lifeboat six. No, no firm so, details yet. So having sorry, everyone. Two but that, to the, a certain extent, the overall plan maybe didn't is see to have some the sort time. of convention. Um, now can see eye to eye, in which all proceeds so would go having, to having the lighthouse. Together, being able and to work together on that's on one of that. my big hopes too. As uh, soon as I found out about it, that they were raising there. money. I, that, I think at the in our interview, I just kind of jokingly floated the idea of like, oh, I'll come up and help out with stuff. She was like, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll email you. I was like, oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm not mad about that. I think that these are important. It's like here in DC, we do have a yes. Titanic memorial, but I'm sorry, it's not yes. that good. Um, yes. Yeah. What? <laughs> I'll send you a light bulb. 
Yeah. Maybe if we, if we give you enough notice, the only, maybe we can get you thing out my here for is whenever for, this for thing happens. The is being in the UK. That's yeah. that's the only thing I I. It's a bit far to swim. Really? Um, but, what a horrible time. You know, to come. from <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, I, so I, I think yeah. um, for me, it's just anyway, being I am, as much a help I, as I am from this side. I am thoroughly honored to, to talk to you. To um, and, I knew that once that I heard more of Robert's that story from, Sat, um, from Sally, that I was like, I need to learn more about this man and it, let yeah, his voice be yeah. heard a little bit more. I, just that now be, that we're uh, getting to the point in our times where we want to hear these other stories, so. they're available and yeah, it would they're be, important. It? Before I let you go, because I'm always reticent to let yes. my guests hang up, is there are there any things that you would like everyone to know about Robert Hitchens that we do not know? Yes. He he, he did. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really, I mean, really, right. to a certain extent, Robert's life is really all, all to see, you know, it's to be seen, and he had a quite a hard life. Yeah. But I think the fact that he was a family man, he loved his wife, he loved his children, uh, yeah. and though he suffered, I don't think because of guilt mm -hmm. particularly, because I think he did what he was supposed to do, but I think... Mm -hmm. Just remembering that he oh I what what should have been a heart, I don't know you know he had a desire I, I for will. his family and his loved ones and I think for me that comes oh, up okay I'll have to look at I mean again I'm from America so as as a relative you know he, he, in the films he's shown as quite harsh and quite you know mm -hmm. he was caught he was from Cornwall as well so his his accent's not right either but we'll mm -hmm. go apart from the accent. Um, yeah, it'd be more yokily. You'll have to they look were, up if you look up real Cornish people. accent, were, you'll find it's a bit different than the film's accent. <laughs> actors or characters, they were people, yeah, exactly. People who had, as you said, so, um, but yeah, loving no, families and who I think wanted if people to go away and, and a loving life with them. learn about their lives individually. Um, it's a thing like you said, really, to actually understand the person, sure, um, maybe apart from the film, so. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's of course. it. Yeah, as so if for me, the book I'm would no have been, for me be doing the book would have been easy just to have done another one. But someone who is book. interested in that, I do want to say thank um, you because it is an excellent resource I, just right to Right from the beginning, decided that was not what I wanted to do. I actually people. wanted everybody's story to be told so yes robert's in there well and there's quotes from robert but thank you i wanted everybody so much to be for coming on as soon as i started reading your book i was like i absolutely made the right choice in basically demanding this man come back uh, to me <laughs> and so uh, but again thank you so much for coming on for talking about your story and robert and just thank you yeah yeah definitely I really appreciate you having me on. I've really enjoyed it. <laughs> no, thank you very much for having me on. It's been wonderful. Thank you very much. I want to thank Simon again so much for his time. That was an amazing interview and you should get in touch with him. You can find Simon on Instagram at Titanic underscore memorabilia. You can also find him online on Facebook on the Facebook group Titanic memorabilia as well as Titanic day by day 360 nope 366 days with titanic um and please i encourage you to get in touch with him because he is amazing and super knowledgeable and i also encourage you to get in touch with me because if you've been listening for this long you should be 
rate, reviewing, and subscribing to my show on your platform of choice. And you should also be liking me on all the social medias, which is Titanic Talkline on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can send me an email at titanictalkline at gmail.com. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.